it's interesting. I've had this struggle all week because I actually feel God's given me two words to say. And I, I've struggled as to, to know which one I should actually release today. Um, and then on Thursday, when we were at school at CSSM, Danielle shared a word. And I thought, ha, ah, that's in the nugget what I want to share, what one of the words is about. So I'm going to get her to share. And it's interesting what's, what's happened this morning and what the words have been about this morning, about freedom and about stepping into that greater freedom. And, you know, I actually feel for some of you, you need to get up in the morning and you need to go, chains, you know, you're no longer there, and do the prophetic act of stepping out of the chains. I actually feel that, um, you know, it's, it's a conscious every day and it's like that until it's not like that anymore. Does that make sense? You know, you know from, from well, you, you know some of the battles I've had over the last two years. And I've had, but for some of you who don't know, I broke my right foot two years ago and it didn't heal. And then just as I, I was not having a healed right foot, my left foot, I broke my left foot. Now to have one broken foot is a pain. To have two broken feet is just a right. <laughs> and it made life very difficult and I didn't stop doing anything I haven't stopped doing anything but um, between the struggles to do with that I then on top of that have a very difficult family situation to do with my own parents um, that has been incredibly hard and incredibly painful so that was happening on top of that I had some other personal stuff going on that I was battling through and you know when things like that happen what you do is you stand on the declarations that God has made and you stand on them and you every day, Lord God, I declare these feet of healed. I ain't gonna be I mean I have a three year old grandson who, you know, can run faster than the know, wind. <laughs> the wind, yes, that's a, I was gonna say, you know, on um, the incredibles, the little da dashes at the runs, yes, he's, he's like that. Um uh, my sister Stuart like hurtling after him sometimes and I'm not quite at hurtling stage yet. I am gonna be. I'm going to be running after that three-year-old, and I'm going to be running after his sister. You know, that that is my destiny. It is not to walk with broken feet for the rest of my life. That is not my destiny. And so you stand on those promises, and, and I know the battle. I have walked through it. I am walking through it. But you stand on, the, on, the, on there. And I think one of the other keys is what Danielle is going to share through her picture. So, Danielle, come up and share your picture. Yes, yeah, so about 10, 11 years ago, God um, gave me this vision and it was, um, I was running this race. Um, so running along and um, like these big black rugby player, hench, demonic things started to come running at me and I was like, oh, and they knocked me flying up the race. And the race restarted and I was running again. And this time Jesus was at the sidelines going, come on, Daniel, keep running, keep running, come on, keep going, keep going. So I was like, okay, let's go, let's go. And uh, so running the next minute, I was where these things were coming again. I was like, oh, these are coming again. And she's like, no, keep eyes forward. You keep running. I'll look after that. And I'm like, okay. And my eyes shot forward to the finish line. And I was like, okay, this is where we're going. And I kept running. And this, as I was running, these things were starting to come again. And angels swooped in and took them out. Yeah, I'm not too worried. And I kept running. So it's like that thing of like, actually, no, our one job is to keep our eyes set ahead. Actually, he does the saving and we be daughters and sons and do what he's asked us to do. That's it. And I know we know that. And we quote the verse, don't we, about keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. But in the moment when things are difficult, it's easy to hear the lies. It's easy to hear the voice of the enemy coming along and going. I mean, you know, I had him saying to me, you run a supernatural school and you've got two broken feet. What kind of supernatural school do you run? You know, it's not true then that you see healing. And I had to stand and go, no, God has called me. My destiny is to run a supernatural school. And I am going to see incredible healings. Every feet, foot that I break for, I pray for, I'm going to see healed in Jesus' name. Because what the enemy has robbed, I know that God is going to give me back sevenfold. So you Amen. stand on the promises, on the truth of what he is. And I, I, I had this sense as, as, as I was preparing my, my two sermons, this is some some one another one, and it's going to be short. Um, is is that for some of us, we're looking at what the enemy's doing, yeah. and we're we're letting the focus be on that. Yeah. So we're seeing like all the negatives, and we're listening to the lies. And I feel that what God is saying is, keep your eyes on me, That's all. Mm. on me, on the promises I've given. I think it's why mm. it's so key what Stuart's done mm. this morning of getting us to to swap our 
challenges for the for the for promises and those promises you know you don't just kind of put it in a dusty little place or tuck it inside your bible you every day declare it over yourself declare that's what your promise is mm. yeah. you are more than i can think dream or imagine so you have the problem the solutions for the problems that i'm facing that's right you are a healer i stand on that and i know that and i declare that mm. and i and I, I i feel that some of us are just are, are going through really challenging times and i and i feel for you i get it i understand it i've walked it myself but it's keeping your eyes on him. And I feel that there's a real invitation into mm. keeping your eyes on him this morning, on focusing on him, and not focusing on the demonic. Because That's you right. know what happens if you focus on the demonic? As soon as you start focusing on the demonic, it puffs up. Yeah. To me, it's like a puffer fish. Do you know what a puffer fish is? Mm. So a puffer fish, when it feels danger, goes and puffs up and becomes this big fish. But actually, it's, a, it's only actually a very small fish. And it's like that with the demonic. As soon as you start giving attention to it and kind of going, this is this is happening, the enemy's doing this and the enemy's doing that in my life, he puffs up to this kind of like big thing. And suddenly it, it, it's, it's a mirage. It's not truth. He's, he's a puffer fish. It's not, it's not the truth. But it will make you feel like the truth. Right. Come on, David. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I just want to encourage you. I'm sharing from my journey and I know... I know how hard it can be. You know, I know for me the, the the nights that I've woken up in pain and the mornings that I've kind of, you know, woken up with no sleep and, you know, and then I've got up and I've, my feet have swollen and I've had a whole day's work ahead of me and, you know, hardly any rest. And it's been t challenging. It has been difficult. And then to have the other things that have happened on top of that. But God, we keep our eyes on him. Mm. We keep our eyes on him. And it's funny, a couple of weeks ago, I felt there was a shift. Now, nothing physically at that moment shifted. Oh my God, countless people pray for my feet. Medical people pray for my feet. People from global work pray for my feet. Nearly every student pray for my feet. Um, because, you know, I'm like a target. I mean, I might as well have painted a target. Really. Um, um, you, had, you had most of David's tent praying for your feet. Yeah, oh, I did. I mean, I, I just had so many people pray, pray, pray for me. And not all of them helpful, some of them helpful. I've learned to um, accept prayer from people who actually believe I'm going to be healed. That's right. <laughs> and that's another mm -hmm. little hint, is accept prayer mm -hmm. from people in your struggle who actually believe God's going to do that's something. Um, but about a fortnight ago, I felt like there was a shift. I felt like a heaviness lifting. And I was like, okay, God, I don't know what that means, but I'm just going to trust in you that, you know, something's happened. And to be honest, I didn't actually think it was anything in relation to my feet. But I, I, not, I wasn't in pain enough to hobble. I know that might seem such a little thing to the rest of you who all have feet. No, but for me, that was a huge, huge step forward because it says that the healing is happening. Oh, yes. Yeah. So... Listen, and it, it's looking for those moments and going, God, I trust you in it. I trust you in it. Even if I'm not seeing, I mean, at the moment I felt the shift, I didn't see the healing, but I trusted. And, and my journey's not been perfect. Stuart will tell you that my journey has not been perfect. There have been plenty of tears, plenty of ugh moments. Yeah. But in that, it's going, but oh God, I will keep my eyes on you and I will Declare the truth, and I won't listen to the enemy. That's it. Listen to what you're saying, and I will step over the chains that the enemy says around me, and I will believe that you have won the victory. Yeah. And I think for some of us, that little refrain that Billy sang this morning, the battle has been won. I think we need to get up in the morning and we need to say, the battle has been won. 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 And in every situation you face, the battle has been won. Because I, I think that was. That was a, a gift from God for all of us this morning. A, a, a little easy declaration that we can all remember and mm -hmm. speak into our situation. Yeah. So that's sermon number one, talk number one. Talk number two is actually about something that I started a few years ago. So in lockdown, um, I spoke to those of you who were part of the church then um, about what it meant to be a prophetic culture. And um, and I spoke to us about to be a prophetic culture, we need to, to be encouraging to one another. But it's very hard to give prophetic words if we aren't even encouraging. Come on. You know, if, if when we say to see somebody, we never say a nice word. And to suddenly kind of call out yeah. the destiny of God on them. You know, if every time I see Colette, I think, hey, that's Colette. But if I never say to her, Colette, you, know, you look lovely today. You look really nice. It's lovely to see you smile. It's so nice being with you. If I don't say some of that stuff to her, and I can't suddenly kind of call out the destiny of God in them. Yeah, and it is yeah. a challenge for us because as British people, 
they tend to be a little bit on the kind of morose negative side. Um, you know, it's one of the differences I found. I remember one time I was um, travelling with Donna De Silva and she asked me to, well, she threw me up at lunchtime, she said, you're doing the next session. Thankfully, Stuart said to me, be ready. Um, so I had been chewing over what God was saying for these leaders and, and I shared about this idea of we're not an encouraging culture, so how can we, That's it. you know, the struggle for us as Brits to step yeah. into the prophetic. And, um, and afterwards she was like, I've never thought of that. And I said, gosh, you know, spending time with you, Donna, makes me feel like the most miserable person in life because That's you just good. naturally say things, nice things to me all the time. You're not prophesying over me. You just say nice things. Yeah. I love that talk. You're, this, you're so good at this. You know, you're so kind. You do. And she just continually says yeah. nice things. I mean, it's like being asking in, you know, a spar of lovely words. And, um, and, and I struggle. Most British people to be like that. Some people are really good at it. John's, John's a good encourager. And um, uh, Stuart's a good encourager. I am. You're a good encourager. Yeah, I am. But it is, you're, yeah, you are a good encourager. Yeah. But it is a struggle for a lot of us just to let those words kind of flow off of our lips, isn't it? Which means it sometimes is hard for us to be a prophetic culture. So to be a prophetic culture, we want to be encouraging. I'm giving you the sermon from two years ago now. We need to yeah. take risks. Because if we yeah, never, ever take a risk... We will never, ever give a prophetic word. That's right. So you have to kind of go, I think God's saying this, I'm going to give it. Which is why we encourage you to not kind of be like, the Lord say it, but just be, I think God might be saying it, and see what happens. And then to get feedback on words. It is so important that we get feedback on words. But I really felt over the last, I mean months, it's probably been over the last year, um, I've really felt that God has been asking us to, to mature as a prophetic culture. Now, what do I mean by that? That's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, exploring with, with us this morning. Because what I see happening is there are probably more people giving prophetic words now than has ever been true in the, in the history of our planet. Yes. You know, prophecy, there's been such an emphasis on the, on the prophetic. There's been so much prophetic training, and that's great, and I love it. But it's creating a culture of prophetic entitlement. And it really came home to me. I was already kind of feeling it. But um, at the Global Awakening Conference that we had back in March, we got all our students, um, Stuart and I, uh, we got all our students to write prophetic words for all the delegates that come into the conference. I gave them to the delegates as they came in. And um, some people had booked on last minute, so they booked on Saturday morning. Last, last Thursday school was Thursday evening. So anybody that booked on between Friday morning through to Saturday morning, unless I personally have time to sit and write a prophetic word, they didn't have. And we had the single rush of five to ten people who booked on last minute. And you know what happened? The vast majority of them came up to me and said, where is my prophetic word? Not, oh, I see people getting prophetic words. Is there one for me? But where is my prophetic word? Yikes. I like saying, mum, well, but still got it. Maybe ask him about it. <laughs> I didn't. I smiled. I smiled. I did to I did manage to be gracious, even though internally I was having a little bit of a kind of struggle in that. I'm so pleased that it's to you and not to me. <laughs> but it, it made me realise that there has been, when we've put on prophetic conferences and people have brought teams to do prophetic words, there has been this kind of entitlement around it. And if there's been a long queue where we've said to people, you know, actually only half that queue is going to get prophesied over because of the time, yeah. the bottom half of the queue moans and grumbles. Instead of seeing it as a privilege that there's even mm. anybody getting a prophetic word in this mm. conference, mm. it's an interesting one, isn't it? Mm. And so this word about what does it look like for us to be mature in the prophetic has been bubbling in me for a while. And um, and then it's interesting. I've suddenly noticed that people like Chris Ballerton and Be uh, Ben Armstrong and Dan McCullum are all putting out this stuff out. Either they're speaking it in sermons or writing it about prophetic maturity and uh, I kind of felt kind of God laughing because I sometimes just think oh I'm little old me and I don't really hear, hear. just me. clearly on this big picture scale of some of these people and then I really I know, I know, I know it's a lie thank you Daniel <laughs> but um, 
We do, and uh, you know, this is so. This is something Stuart and I have been talking about, and and um, but I've put it together in, in this talk this morning. So, what does maturity look like prophetically? I think one of the things it looks like prophetically is understanding that we all hear from God. That's right. We all hear from God. From young to old, as it says in Joel, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's right. Not some, all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Lots of sons and daughters in this room. Your old men will dream dreams. I'm not going to make a comment about the old men. <laughs> but who's dreaming dreams, huh? Um, <laughs> your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I mean, there isn't anybody that isn't covered by that verse, is there? We're all covered by that verse. We can all hear from God. We can all hear what he wants to say to us. And we can all prophesy. This is the absolutely unbelievable privilege of being in the New Covenant. That's right. Because in the Old Covenant, it was that you had to have a special prophet. You had to have the Isaiahs or the Jeremiahs or the Ezekiels the Amos's or Hosea's to come and speak the word of God to you. Wow. But now we don't have to have that. All of us, all of us from the youngest, the youngest, I presume, um, to the oldest, I won't point at the oldest, the oldest. Um, <laughs> Good job. Good <laughs> <lad. laughs> <laughs> <It's not me. laughs> Oh, there's a picky on you. <laughs> And the moon. But just think. Yeah, but he is old, let's face it. Well, he is old, oh dear. <laughs> Wise. Oh, let's. Um, <laughs> we can all prophesy. Come on. And we can, but I guess more than that is we all can hear from God. We don't actually need the celebrity prophet to That's rock right. up in town for us to hear from God. That's right. And I think one of the things that is happening is there is a bit of kind of celebrity, because of our culture, we've brought it into the church, and there is this sort of culture of celebrity prophet happening. And it's one of the reasons that we align ourselves so clearly with Bethel and the Bethel stream of the prophetic, because I don't see that happening there. Now, there are definitely people who have the office of prophet, like Chris Allerton and Ben Armstrong, but what they don't do is raise themselves up as a nice. who gives the word all the time. What you see them doing is equipping that people thing. around them. Yeah. And that's actually the mark of the Office of a Prophet. Yeah. Not, I've got a pedestal and I have to be the one who gives a good prophetic word all the time. And so, <laughs> a mature prophetic culture is one where we all hear from God. Yeah. Okay? And that we understand that prophecy is for all of us, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even, even more, I wish you could all prophesy. That's Paul's desire was for us all to prophesy. Not, not just one or two people. Um, you know, we should use people who are further down the line. So I look at people like Chris Allerton and Dan McCullum and the words that they release and Hedy Brown and others, and I think, wow, you know, that's inspirational. But I don't raise them up. You know, when Ben Armstrong comes, he's no... He's not a celebrity. That's it, come on. He's just further down the road than we are. And we want to learn from him, but we don't want to elevate him. And we want to honour him, but that doesn't mean elevating him. That's right. And um, I do think that is one of the things that we need to kind of resist is, is this sort of elevation of, of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we need to stop elevating a particular style as well. Because actually a, a mature prophetic community means there is space for different prophetic expressions, whether that's art, whether that's prophetic expressions through dance, whether that's prophetic poetry or prophetic, you know, whatever it looks like. It will, it will mean that even the way that we speak prophetic words will, will be different. And the, and the way that we, um, what kind of prophetic words we speak out are different. So a prophetic culture 
means we can all hear and we can all prophesy. That's right. But it also about is about us taking responsibility for processing and partnering the prophetic words given to us. It would seem to me that what's happening is that people are collecting prophetic words a bit like a stamp collection. So they put them in their album, i.e. their journal, and they might look at them every now and again, but they basically kind of go, well, God, you said it, you do it. Yikes. You know, if you get a prophetic word, it is an invitation to you. That's it. It's the equivalent of being giving a wedding invitation. That's right. Now, a wedding invitation, you can stick it on your fridge. You can go, oh, well, there's the wedding on the 15th of July. And, you know, I hope it'll be a great day and everything. But actually, you don't get to go to the wedding unless you go buy the dress or the outfit. You go buy the wedding present. You book the accommodation nearby the wedding. You RSVP to the wedding invite. And then you actually have to turn up. And so it's the same with the prophetic word. We actually have to partner with God when we're given a prophetic word. It's not that it sits on a shelf and we go, God, you do it. God always wants to partner with us in order for a prophetic word to be done. You know, Stuart and I, we had last year, well, over the last couple of years, so many words of our increase to do with our school. Last year, it stayed about the same number. It didn't decrease, but it didn't particularly increase. But we haven't left it on the shelf. You know, what we're not doing is going, well, God, you just do it. Yeah. We're saying, God, is there any, anything in us that means you're, that that's not happened? So we're dealing with us. And one of the things we're doing is we're actually having a, a sozo with um, Steve De Silva while we're in, in Bethel in, in a few weeks' time. Um, because he particularly looks at organisational and issues to do with that sort of stuff. So we felt it was right that, to have a, a joint sozo with him. Um, but at the same time, we have kind of got asked some mature people who we know, like, can you pray into this with us? And then um, we've done things like we've encouraged, you know, one word came back about testimonies, you're not releasing the testimony, so we've been active. If you look at our social media now, it's pumped full of testimonies. Yesterday we recorded, goodness knows how many testimonies from our students, and we'll be putting those out on, the, on social media. So we're actively kind of pushing into the word. We're not just kind of going, yeah, yeah, increase will happen, it's up to you, God. We're saying, what is it, God, that you need to do in us or through us to allow that word to happen? And a prophetic maturity is doing that. It's not just going, well, God, you once said this word 30 years ago about me doing this. And then going, well, that was nice. Or, you know, you said that word last year, but, you know, it's just in my journal. It has to look like there's partnering with him. That's it. Come on. You have to look, activate it. And then prophecy is not about focusing on future prediction, but is about forming the future. You know, it's kind of amused me. This year, did you know, there are um, 64 countries, I think, going to polls this year. And we're not the only country who's going to be having elections. But something like 64 countries are going to the polls. 49% of the world's population are going to be voting yeah. in those elections this year. It's an unusual occurrence. It normally doesn't fall quite this much. And what are the prophetic words? There's going to be change. Well, yeah, really? <laughs> it's not a prophetic word to say it, the obvious. But we actually cause the future by our prophetic words. I thought it was interesting that Steve actually brought up about Moses lifting up his hands. Well, what Moses, as a prophet, what was he doing as he lifted up his hands? He caused the future. That's he caused the battle to be won. So in our prophetic words, we want to be creating the future, not declaring the future, does that make sense? Not predicting the future. And I think that's one of the things that we need to really get hold of because I see this kind of prophetic voice around that is all about kind of prediction and it's becoming quite negative about the future and that isn't going to cause a negative future because it's making declarations a negative and we don't believe that we believe we're going from glory to glory 
we believe the kingdom of God is here and is establishing itself. And so we need to partner with that in what we say. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 says, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Yeah. We have access to the mysteries of God. And you know, you know, the mysteries of God are not like, ooh, you know, stuff we don't really need. They're not kind of... The mysteries of God are the things that you and I and our world needs. They're the solutions to the political issues we're facing. They're the solutions to the medical challenges we're facing. They're the solutions to the wars that are happening. That is what we're pressing into when we see the mysteries. And I believe a mature prophetic community causes the future by prophesying into those things. So what does that look like? Well, one of the things that I find really inspirational, and some of you might know that we're kind of further down the road with, with this with our school because we have got a prophetic community that we've been, uh, that are our alumni, chosen to kind of keep coming and uh, pressing into the prophetic. And we have been really asking God to kind of develop us in the prophetic community. And, but the aim of that is not that just we'll get really good at prophecy, but that we will start stewarding the mysteries of heaven into the seven mountains. If you want to know what the seven mountains are, it's like business, education, religion, family, politics, and all, all of those things, so all the things that kind of cover our world. And it will look like us finding missing children. It will look like solutions for business. It will look like a family in crisis being given strategies to move forward. It will look like a government and official being given a blueprint for the economic future. Mm. It will look like someone in education being given a strategy. It will look like people who help those with trauma being given the keys to break those trauma. Now, if you think that's pie in the sky, let me tell you, it's not. There are already prophetic communities around the world who are doing this. And as I say, our prophetic community is on the journey to it. We're not doing it yet, but we're on the journey to it. We'll get there. Um, you know, such as Dan McCullum in, in, the, in the US, who already, the FBI, get his prophetic communities to help them find children, missing children. Because 12,000 children in the US go missing every year. And they're helping find those 12,000 children. Or Chris Vallotton, who's leading prophetic communities into the into government, into the US government, and is speaking in, into that. So how about us as a church? Well, I believe that we're not just to stop having encouraging prophetic words, as good as that is, and as much as I want to encourage us. Like, if you walk through these doors of, of our church and aren't given a prophetic word by somebody, I'm sorry, because that is our heart. We want everyone to be encouraged with, with what God is saying to you. But I want us to shift past that into this place where we truly partner with the prophetic to see it activated in our lives, to see the prophetic words activated in our lives, but also to start seeing spirit strategies. Yeah. Now, I literally want it to be that people walk into here and they kind of go, you know, I have an issue with my business. And three or four of us gather around and go, God, what are you saying? What's the strategy that this person needs with their business? Or somebody says, you know, I've got an issue with my family and I, I don't know how to resolve it. And a few of us gather around and go, you know, how can we pray into that? What is God saying? What's a prophetic strategy? And I want us to grow into that. And I think that's what prophetic maturity will be like when we actually are the answer to people's issues because Jesus is the answer. Yeah, very good. Cool. So I don't know about you, but that excites me. Yeah. You know, and I... And I see some of it, you know, I see, like, as you know, I'm um, super involved in the Sozo world. And I see that happening. I see God giving and downloading strategies within that. But sometimes, you know, I'll be sat with somebody and I'll be like, God, I have no idea what to do there. But there's no source of tool that covers this situation. What do you want? You just give me something and I'll go with it. And then a few months later, I'll be talking to Dawn or I'll be talking to somebody else that I know in the Sozo world and they'll go, you know, what's that in the Sozo? And God just said this to do this. And suddenly we're like, huh, he's downloaded a new strategy. And usually what happens is he downloads it to a number of us across the world at a different time. 
you know, and then we get together in some context and we start sharing and we realise, ah, oh, God's downloaded another strategy. But I'm, you know, that that's my area of influence. But in your area of influence, I believe he wants to download strategies for you. There you go. And for the people around you. That's what. And I want us to step into that. So why don't we just stand for a moment? Now, if you're stood there and you're kind of going, yes, that's what I want. I want to see a prophetic gifting that actually starts forming the future rather than just predicting it. Then I can't think of a, a good prophetic act to do. <laughs> I feel like we, we do need to sort of step forward. Um, yeah, so God, I thank you. I thank you that um, in us, we are saying yes to that prophetic maturity that means that we don't just grab the words for ourselves. We don't just stop at the level of encouraging people, but actually we press in to see the solutions for our world. And God, you know that we need those solutions. We look at government and politics and education and healthcare and God, there are solutions that are needed. So God, would you renew our minds so that we begin to focus in on forming the future and not get just stuck with predicting it. And maybe just put your hand on your head and just say, God, renew my mind. In my mind, so that I will become you. Someone who sees prophetic solutions. Mature that gifting in me. Amen. Talking and complaining is growing a future. It's not just so how I feel that. I just um, he wants me to do this week to keep my phone out. Look at the start of Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. By, the trans by your transformed mind, be able to test and approve that which is good or that which comes from Christ. Keep blowing this up. I, I want to I be the one who has the answer. I don't want to complain about what isn't. I want to speak to what it what is going to be because I've got an answer. And expect that in your home, in your family, in your businesses, and then write it down and keep the testimony. We've done some great stuff this morning. We don't finish now, but we do go into a different phase. The phase of being able to have snacks and drinks. And if you want prayer for something, something spoken into you and you want to be able to follow it up. You can speak to me or Liz or just, I mean, really just about anybody you can turn to and say, please, can you pray about this for me? And then when you're ready, you can wander off. We will be doing some tidying up sort of around that time as well. We'll be back here next week. We set up from 10.15. You are all welcome to come and take part in that so that you can participate and have drinks and snacks and all that sort of stuff. And then we start vaguely around 11 and we finish when we're done. So we're, we're transitioning into drinks and time to chat with each other. But... Don't lose what the Lord's been saying. So if you're like, you know, actually, I think I've got an answer for you, you or you, go and follow it up. Or if you're like, well, I need an answer, yeah. go and get some. It's just, it's just a different phase because mm -hmm. worship, worship and encountering God, it shouldn't be about this slot. This is the focus, but it's then outpour into the rest of our week. Because otherwise, that's you know, we're just having a, we're just having a nice jolly time. That's not the point. The point is to be tra transformed to be a transformation. So let's just keep on doing that as we as we chat and drink. And I haven't had much to a breakfast yet, so I'm hoping there's a croissant left. But there might not be because I might have already eaten, but that's fine. Okay, so let's get drinks and snaps back here next week.